All right, so should we, should, should we start? Or do you think we should, we should wait uh, some more time? I, I, I don't know if this is necessary. I think that uh, this virtual conference is going smoothly, so people <laughs> should, should be already here. They, they will not have trouble joining us. Um, so we can start. What do you think? Yes. Uh, all the speakers are here, yes. Right. Uh, OK, so thank you uh, and welcome to this session on the history of European microeconomics. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we suggest uh, that the session runs uh, following this organization. So I will start just with a few uh, general words introducing the purpose of this session or the, the spirit uh, in which this session was organized. Um, then we will have the three papers, uh, presentations, uh, and uh, each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes uh, top. Uh, and this will leave us in the, at the end of the session uh, at least 30 to 45 minutes for questions and general discussion. All right. Let me start so with... Uh, uh, With, with some, again, some general remarks, some introductory uh, remarks. Uh, maybe with something very obvious, that is that today, uh, economic knowledge produced we, uh, in any department of any European university will not look significantly different from economic knowledge produced in any department of a US university. And this is result of a long process uh, of convergence of theoretical approaches, methodologies, and professional standards, broadly defined. Uh, a process that was highlighted notably uh, by the work of Bob Coates uh, on the internationalization of economics, and more recently uh, by works like uh, those of Marion Fourcade uh, on economics as a global profession. Uh, and this internationaliza internationalization or this uh, rise of economics as a global profession, uh, this is somehow a recent uh, phenomenon the starting in the 70s, uh, but proceeding at different paces in different European countries. And so the first interest that we shared, uh, all the authors of the, the, the three papers in this session, uh, is an interest in documenting how this convergence path uh, uh, differs across different countries on different topics or different uh, institutions. And the second common insight that we had is that this internationalization of economics uh, was not solely, solely the uh, discussion between each European national tradition and the US uh, economics tradition, but that there was also an element of uh, European transnational dialogue and the emergence at the European level uh, of a network of researchers uh, from different uh, countries, so from Belgium, from France, from the UK, from the Netherlands, uh, a network of European economists that started operating and actively uh, working together on some shared topics and some shared um, uh, issues. So th this European network is somehow easily uh, visible uh, because it is embodied and materialized by the emergence of different types of institutions. One very obvious one, which is the first one we will going to hear about, is the European Economic Review, who, which was established in uh, 1969, uh, and which later became the journal of the European Economic Association, uh, which was established in uh, 1985, if I remember correctly. Uh, there's two examples of those institutions that have been supporting uh, the, 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 the development of this European network. Uh, but there are others, uh, 
can think, for instance, to, to research centers like the, the Belgian Core Research Center, uh, which, uh, as for instance, Thierry Dupé uh, show, has shown in his recent paper on this, uh, was really a hub for European researchers to discuss common uh, issues and producing common research and building uh, shared views about economics and shared views about how the profession of economics should be uh, organized and structured in Europe. Uh, and the last question that brought us together, the, 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 member, the, the authors presenting in this session, is uh, the, a question about the intellectual role that macroeconomics in particular uh, played in this process of interna internationalization, which is, again, both uh, the debate or the, dia the dialogue between uh, the US and Europe and the dialogue uh, across Europe. Uh, so the three papers that are, that, are, that, that are presented today suggest that indeed macroeconomics played a, a, a specific role and a driving role in the uh, process of internationalization of economics in Europe. Uh, and this brought us to some okay. different questions, some, some further questions uh, that uh, are okay. more... Uh, that are more on uh, the ways European macroeconomics intellectually uh, managed to adapt or to resist or to depart or to provide alternative uh, intellectual paths with respect to uh, US-based macroeconomics uh, on different issues that we will talk about today, like uh, equilibrium or macroeconometrics or economic independence. Uh, in the independence, uh, interdependence, sorry, uh, and so far and so on. So the first paper will be uh, kind of a big picture of all the three questions that I just tried to sketch. Uh, will be presented by Aurélien Gutzmet and Alexandre Kruk, uh, who are deciding to use uh, quantitative methods, so cost station, coupling, uh, tapping modeling, uh, and to apply these methods to the European Economic Review to see what are the distinctive topics that emerge uh, uh, in this uh, in the publications of this journal. The second paper by Mathieu Renaud, who is joining us today because he's coming back from another conference, so he's joining us today from the train. Uh, so uh, is the normally is the quotes or Roman Plassard who will be presenting because the connection should be more, <laughs> more stable. Uh, so Romain and Mathieu uh, will present a paper uh, about what is, well, I would say that a well-known uh, peculiarity of European macroeconomics, uh, that is the disequilibrium approach. But they have some uh, new insights and original insights about uh, this approach and the way uh, theoretical developments were linked to uh, the intention of uh, using this approach for policy uh, advice and uh, they will uh, particularly talk about how this brought uh, people working with these fixed price equilibrium models to develop original empirical strategies and finally there will be a third paper by myself uh, antonella rancan and juana costa uh, who he's uh, not here, I think, but Antonella, she is here. Uh, and this will be a paper about macroeconometric modeling in the specific institutional context, which is the European uh, Commission. So I leave the floor to Aurélien or to Alexandre, I don't know, one of the two, for the first presentation, 10 to 15 minutes, then uh, Mathieu, and then myself, and then we should go on for the uh, discussion in question. Thank you, Francesco. Is it okay? Is everyone seeing the, the slides? Okay, great. So thank you, Francesco, for the introduction and also for spoiling part of my presentation. Uh, <laughs> and good afternoon to everyone. So what I will present you is the first steps uh, of a project conducted with Alexandre Truc on the history of European macroeconomics for the European Economic Review. 
And what we are trying to do is to identify if there exists between the 70s and the early 2000s, a European identity in macroeconomics, uh, if there exists some um, typical approaches and research programs in Europe. So Francesco, I've talked a bit about that, uh, I won't be long, but uh, so since the 70s, the economics discipline has gone through a process of internationalization. Um, perhaps some, some common patterns in that uh, are the standardization of PhD programs, uh, the generalization of publication criteria for assessing research, uh, the spreading of international conferences, uh, or the training of many European economists in the US, and this process of internationalization is also in a large part a process of Americanization uh, as it went hand in hand with the adoption of many research standards that had become mainstream uh, in the United States since the Second World War. I'm thinking to the use of mathematical modeling uh, to neoclassical theory as a benchmark for these models or uh, to the rising importance of uh, econometrics. And so something perhaps less clear is so we can observe a similar process of Europeanization in the discipline within European countries uh, since the 70s. So the, 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 the research question that drives us with Alexandre is, uh, has the process of Americanization led European economists to, to merely adopt US standards and do the same things as US-based economists? Or have they developed uh, from these same standards some new approaches, some uh, autonomous research programs uh, distinct from what US economists were doing and common to economists in different uh, European countries. We have decided to, to focus on, on macroeconomics for two reasons. Uh, first, as such a study involved a large set of articles to look at, uh, it seems necessary to, to reduce a bit the scale of uh, our analysis. And uh, it appears easier to, uh, to focus on a subfield we know more about uh, because of existing histories of the field or because of our own past works. What we, 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 we are trying to do in this project is best to, to pursue what I have begun in an article written with uh, Mathieu Renaud and Francesco Sergi. We have uh, studied the evolution of an annual conference, uh, the International Seminar on Macroeconomics which started in 78 and which has contributed to intensify contacts uh, between European and US macroeconomists, but which was also an important event in the emergence of a new network of uh, European economists. Besides what was also interesting for us is that by looking at the content of this conference, we could see that uh, macroeconometric modeling and disequilibrium theory were two central research programs uh, for Europeans in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, clearly distinct from what the US macroeconomists were doing at the time. Uh, so in a way, in, in this new project, we, we would like to, to generalize uh, this article and identify more clearly different European particularities. Uh, and we want to do this in a larger period by, uh, by going until the, the early 2000s. And we will do that by focusing on the European Economic Review uh, why that? The first reason is uh, that the European Economic Review is a typical example of the internationalization and Americanization of economics in Europe. Uh, from its creation in 69, it was planned that the journal will publish articles only in English. And the goal was also to promote uh, European economist work in mathematical economics and econometrics. And it was not hidden at all, but the goal was to imitate the American Economic Review for Europe. Uh, because it would become a, a very central journal in Europe, uh, we think that it's a good observation point to investigate this dual issue of an Americanization versus an Europeanization of uh, macroeconomics in Europe. At this, uh, in the 70s, Belgium was uh, central in the creation and emergence of the European Economic Review, uh, but more generally, Belgium was central in the development of uh, new networks and institutions for uh, European economics. As soon as 61 was created, the European Scientific Association of Applied Economics, uh, the ASPELT, by Jean Valbrug and Etienne Kirchen, uh, both at the Free University of Brussels. Uh, it published in English uh, a built-in gathering research in econometrics and mathematical economics. 
In 66, uh, the Catholic University of Louvain, before it split, uh, was created, uh, created the Center for Operations, Research, and Econometrics, the core, uh, which was created by Jacques Drez after he's coming back from the, the United States. And as Francesco told us, uh, Til Dupeux has well documented how this research center would quickly become central in Europe uh, to gather European researchers to work uh, notably on the general equilibrium theory. And uh, Jean Valbrouck was instrumental in elaborating a partnership between the Free University of Brussels and Louvain. In 69, uh, Valbrouck, with another colleague from Brussels, uh, Herbert Gleiser, launched the European Economic Review as the official journal of the aspect. And the goal stayed the same, uh, promoting in English mathematical economics and econometrics in Europe. But the, the, the review did not remain just a Belgian initiative, and it quickly extended to other European countries in, in the early 70s. Uh, and the review progressively internationalized, internationalized also by uh, welcoming the proceedings of international conferences. And the most important was perhaps the, the publication in a special issue of uh, the articles presented each year in the International Seminar on Microeconomics. Uh, co-organized by the OHSS in France and the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, and finally, the European Economic Association was created in 85, with clearly, again, the American Economic Association as a model, and the European Economic Review logically became the official journal of the association. Here we can see uh, the national affiliations of the economists publishing in the European Economic Review, and so in the first years, Belgian and Dutch economists represented more than one third uh, of the authors publishing in the review. And then the participation of many other European countries increased. Uh, and this is also the case for uh, the United States uh, in, the first, uh, in the first decade. Here we can also see how US economists gained in importance in the first decade of the journal. Uh, with more and more contributions by US economists uh, alone, and also more contribution of US economists co-written with uh, European-based economists. What we can observe also is uh, in the first three decades of the review history, uh, you have an increased importance in terms of citation uh, in macroeconomics. Uh, the review was more and more cited in proportion of the total number of citations uh, and even overcome the economic journal at the end of the, of the 90s. So that, that was the big lines of the review history. Uh, I have underlined its role in, in the development of European macroeconomics, and we have seen its links with US economists. But now, how can we identify the particularities of European macroeconomics? So our general uh, goal is just to look systematically at publications in the European Economic Review and to compare them to the top five journals. Uh, the first step was to build uh, our database. Uh, the information we need implied to use uh, several different databases. First, uh, we identify macroeconomic articles using the gel codes. Then uh, references in bibliography and affiliations were extracted thanks to the Web of Science database, uh, but also thanks to Scopus uh, to complete some missing years in, in Web of Science. And uh, third, we used the Microsoft Academic database to retrieve uh, the abstracts for uh, six journals. In, the, 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 we, in this project, we used two different quantitative methods on our corpus uh, to allow cost validation and complementary analysis. The first one is topic modeling, uh, which is applied on the titles and abstracts uh, of our corpus. The algorithm identifies uh, words that are appearing together and will create uh, k different uh, topics. So for each word, uh, we get a kind of a membership rate uh, to every topic. And so the, the words with the, it means that the words with the highest rates for one uh, particular topic thus allow us to describe uh, what the topic is. Uh, for instance, our topic two can be described by uh, monetary policy, policymaker, tailor, and credibility. Uh, similarly, each article of the top five and European Economic Review has a membership rate to every topic, uh, which allows us to know of what each article is talking about. 
The second method we use is bibliometric coupling. Uh, here we look at the references cited uh, by articles and we connect two articles if they have some references in common. Uh, so we are building a succession of network for 10 year windows. Uh, that is one network for 69.78, one for 70.79, et cetera, et cetera, until uh, 98, uh, 2007. And for each window, we are identifying communities, uh, that is clusters of articles which are citing a lot of references in common. And finally, we identify persistent community across uh, these different windows. To identify European communities and topics, we are, just, we are crossing two scales. Uh, first, obviously, we are looking at what is published in macroeconomics in the top five and what is published in the European, European Economic Review. Uh, but also, we are also looking at what Europe-based economists are publishing in comparison to what United States-based economists uh, are publishing. And so outside of this uh, quantitative identification, uh, our quantitative results will guide us to, to push research in a more uh, qualitative analysis. For instance, it could help us uh, knowing which articles we should read or which authors or institutions we should uh, focus on. So here is the first uh, snapshot of our analysis for uh, topic modeling. Uh, on the right, uh, the topics which are the most associated with Europe-based economists, and on the upper part, uh, the topics the most associated with the European Economic Review. Um, I'm going quickly on that, but I will highlight three interesting groups uh, at the end of the presentation. And so we have done the same thing with uh, bibliometric coupling. Uh, so we can see, for instance, how much the disequilibrium community is dominated by European-based economists uh, and by publication in the European Economic uh, Review. The first observation that uh, could be obvious but remains, uh, I think, interesting is that in the two different in the two graphs you have a positive correlation. Uh, so it means that the topics and the bibliometric communities, the more associated with the European Economic Review, are also the topics and communities for which more European economists are contributing. So ma ma many, many works uh, remain to, to do to identify more systematically European uh, particularities, but I would like to conclude to, to highlight three uh, research programs that I think are uh, interesting. The first obvious one so is the, the uh, disequilibrium theory, which is clearly the most uh, European uh, community. In the, in the European Economic Review, we find many contributions about fixed price models. Uh, the, the review notably welcomes many empirical applications of disequilibrium theory, uh, like, for instance, uh, Snisen's estimated macroeconomic model uh, for Belgium or Artus model for, for France. But the, this research program was really widespread uh, in Europe and connected economists from uh, the UK, from France, Belgium, of course, but also uh, Italy or even Sweden. And uh, this research program also constituted a, an alternative to the new classical micro foundation research program, uh, which was much less represented uh, in the economic review, uh, according to, to our data. And the, 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 the disequilibrium research program seems to have lost uh, its influence in the mid 80s in our data, but we have identified a community that is taking over and that has many characteristics in common. Uh, that, is, uh, that means many, many references and many authors in common, the disequilibrium, disequilibrium community. So that's a research program that we have uh, labeled uh, sunspots and multiple equilibria. Uh, it is present in our data from 83 to the late uh, 90s. And uh, for instance, the work of Azariadis and Grandmont uh, were crucial there. Um, and so when, when we look at the references, uh, the most cited in this community in uh, the article published in the European Economic Review, uh, we see that many references are coming from uh, the, the disequilibrium research program, uh, meaning that uh, the Europe, European part of this literature on sunspots has strong roots uh, in the disequilibrium approach. And finally, I would like to, to, to underline uh, the importance of another European research program uh, in the 90s this time, 
uh, the one around uh, political macroeconomy and the issue of central bank mandates and monetary policy frameworks. Uh, the intellectual foundations of this program are clearly to be found in some uh, US contributions and, and notably the work of Kidland and Prescott on, on timing consistency. But uh, many economists promoting this line of research in the 90s are based in Europe, uh, many in Italy, like, like uh, Javadzi or Pagano, but also in the UK, like John Driffield uh, in Southampton, or at least they have strong ties with Europe, uh, like Roberto Alesina. And what we can observe in terms of institution is a strong connection between the Bocconi boys, uh, linked in different ways to the University of Bocconi in Milan, uh, like Alesina, Tabellini, Javadzi, and the Institute for uh, International Economic Studies in Stockholm uh, with Svensson, Lars Svensson, uh, with Thorsten Persson or Henrik Horn. So this is, this is for the description of our general project and our first general results. So we have more or less completed the, the, the elaboration of our quantitative methods and we have our first results, but we still have, have a lot to do, a lot of work to do to, to analyze and interpret uh, further these results which means that uh, your comments and suggestions are more than welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for keeping the time. And so now we will pass the, pass the mic. I don't know how do you say in, in Zoom language, but <laughs> Romain, it's, it's your turn to present. I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint. Normally that should be possible. Okay, we can see. Can you see it? Yeah. There you go. Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, hi everyone. Thanks uh, Francesco for the introduction and thanks to all of you for attending this uh, session. Um, um, today I'm going to present a new working paper that, I'm, uh, uh, that is co-written with uh, Mathieu Renaud, the rise and fall of Europe's specialty in macroeconomics. So with uh, Mathieu Renaud uh, from the University Côte d'Azur, we are interested in a broad movement uh, that we can see in the history of macroeconomics. So what happened is that in the early 70s, uh, it emerged a new approach to uh, macroeconomics. And uh, this approach consisted in building general equilibrium model in which for given price and wages, you could have disequilibria uh, on a market. Uh, this uh, approach was present on both sides of the Atlantic in the early 70s. It was present so in the US and especially in France and Belgium in the early 70s, but rapidly uh, it disappeared in the US and uh, it get uh, stronger and stronger in Europe to uh, eventually disappear also in Europe. And what we are trying to do with Mathieu is to explain uh, this broad movement. Um, of course, I need to convince you that uh, disequilibrium theory uh, indeed was a European specialty. Um, Aurelien has already uh, told you that this is what is striking when you look at the data. And I'm going to provide you some uh, proof that are uh, based on quotation and the first quotation is la, from a letter that I found while uh, consulting uh, Herschel Grossman's archives at Brown University. Um, so Grossman and Solo are two uh, American macroeconomists. And uh, here is the context of the exchange. Uh, we are in 1977. Uh, Robert Solo just got elected uh, new, the, the president of the American Economic Association, and he's trying to put together the program of the next meeting. And he has the idea to uh, organize a special session on what he called uh, non-market clearing macroeconomics. So this is for us general equilibrium model with rationing, uh, like we can find in the, in the French literature, uh, but also in the US. And uh, he, he sends a letter to Grossman. Uh, why Grossman? Because Grossman had contributed to the development of general equilibrium model with rationing. And he asked Grossman to help him to organize this session. Grossman says, I'm in, but we have a problem. And the problem is that here in the US, uh, there is not a lot of people, not to say no, no more people working on this type of models, on this type of macroeconomics. The authors doing this work, as he says, are European. And then he gives a list of names that includes, uh, for instance, uh, Jean-Pascal Benassi or Jean-Michel Gros. 
10 years later, uh, Richard Portes uh, gives the same diagnosis uh, in a different context. So this is an ex uh, a quotation from an article that he wrote for the American, uh, for the European Economic Review. And the debate was about whether there exists a European economics. And he says that non-Valrasian macroeconomics was not embraced in the US. It has now become something of a European specialty. Portes does not give um, a list of countries uh, in Europe where a general equilibrium model with rationing uh, were developed at the time, but uh, we did this work uh, with Mathieu and we ended up uh, having a very, very long list. Uh, we were pretty surprised. And the list includes, as you can see, Belgium, France, Germany, Poland, Hungary, and the UK. I wanted to, I just want to stress that, as you can see, uh, general equilibrium models with rationing were not only developed in Western Europe, but also in what we called uh, at the time Eastern Europe. Um, so what are the questions that we'd like to uh, address in our article? We have two main questions. The first question is why did general equilibrium model with rationing become uh, a, a European specialty? Uh, and second question, did they disappear because of some sort of Americanization of macroeconomics? So the idea that we would like to test uh, with Mathieu is whether uh, Amer uh, European economics, uh, economists stop developing uh, this type of model, general equilibrium model with rationing, because something really different was done uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. To, uh, uh, to write our article, we have the chance to have a very rich uh, literature on which we can rely on. Uh, so first, there is a, like a, an important literature on the internationalization of economics in Europe. Just giving you here like the example of a, of a book edited by Bob Coates in 2000, but I could have had um, uh, like uh, Marion, Marion Fourca's work or the recent article uh, that uh, Aurélien, uh, Francesco and Mathieu uh, published uh, on, the, on this, on ISOM, which was the like uh, seminar organized uh, in Europe on the model of the NBR conference. And, um, and uh, we also have uh, a really important literature on the history of general equilibrium uh, model with rationing. Again, I've just given you the example of, the, the, of a book written by Roger and Moreau that are here, and that's great. Um, uh, so this is really uh, useful for us to guide our, our research. Now, let me say a few words on our method. To answer these two questions, we uh, started by building a, a large data set, including most of the articles and book uh, on uh, general equilibrium models with rationing. And I would say for the first time, uh, uh, we also con conducted uh, several interviews with uh, scholars that uh, were important users of general equilibrium models with rationing over the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, again, the list here is not uh, exhaustive. I, I, I just wanted to give you some of the names because I want to insist on the profiles of the in economists and P of the scholars we interviewed with uh, Mathieu. So let's start with uh, Antoine Dautum and, and uh, Pierre Dehaize. So Antoine Dautum is a French uh, macroeconomist uh, and Dehaize is a, is a Belgian economist. So the, the, what uh, brings them together is that they are general equilibrium theorists that had not, let's say, interest in the empirical implication of, of their work. And this contrasts, for instance, with two other people that are mentioned here, that is to say, uh, Lubrano and, uh, and Salanier. So Lubrano and Salanier were uh, are uh, econometricians, and they both contributed to uh, uh, first design econometric methods to uh, uh, estimate general equilibrium model with restraining, but also try to test uh, general equilibrium models uh, against uh, data. I also wanted to uh, add uh, on the list uh, Charenza and Groniski because uh, these are two Polish uh, economists who contributed to the application 
of uh, general equilibrium model with rationing on uh, the Polish economy. When we needed with Mathieu to have like more information or you know just to uh, follow up uh, with question uh, with some of the actors, we we sent also e emails and we had uh, uh, some correspondence with uh, with uh, scholars like Dres Grandmont, Alain Montfort, another econometrician, and Volker Bob. Now let me move to the preliminary results. So. Basically, the history that we would like to trace is in three steps. We have like first a development of general equilibrium model with versioning uh, around what we call the uh, Franco-Belgian axis. And then this is a second step, uh, step general equilibrium model with versioning spread it over uh, Western Europe. And the third step was their spread in uh, Eastern Europe. And this is this broad story that we would like to tell in our article. And uh, so far, we have identified a list of factors to explain the deployment of general equilibrium models with rationing across Europe, and a list of factors to explain why, in Europe, European economists uh, stopped having interest or lost interest in uh, this uh, modeling technique. Uh, given time constraints, I'm not going to enter into the detail of each one of these factors. I'm going to pick one or two, and uh, I'm going to pick like the, the fourth one uh, in particular, because I think it's really important just to have like a simple argument in mind, is that to understand um, the deployment of general equilibrium models with rationing in Europe, we just need to see whether they there were specific problems in Europe, for instance. And we just uh, uh, ask this question, and we realize that at the time, in Eastern Europe, they had specific problem with planification, and they considered that general equilibrium model with rationing was a good tool to address these problems. So uh, we had in this interview that we had with uh, uh, Sharemza and Kroniski, they explained to us that in the early 80s, uh, they were interested in understanding how the Polish economy worked, and they were in a situation in which the central planner set prices for a very, very long time. They could observe some queuing in several markets, and they were trained to, understand, to assess the extent of the queuing and to understand how all this queuing could spill over across market. And general equilibrium model with rationing offer the perfect tool to address this type of issue. And again, I'm going to stick to this, uh, to this idea of, the, of a specific problem to France, to, under, uh, to Europe, to understand why a general equilibrium model uh, disappeared from Europe. When you ask uh, the question to, to uh, Sharemza and Groniski, they had like a really simple answer, is that at the end of the 80s, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a transition of the Polish economy to a market economy. And because of this transition, general equilibrium model with rationing looked less appealing, less interesting. And mm, on the other hand, they had other important issues to, to deal with. So for instance, Sharemza got interested in hyperinflation. Um, so again, uh, if you have uh, any question uh, on, on, on other factors, feel free to ask us. Mathieu is here and he can reply in the chat and I can reply uh, to you directly. Uh, this is a very preliminary uh, paper, so we are. Uh, it would be happy to have your feedbacks on how to improve the story uh, or certain arguments. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Romain. And I will now give the floor to myself uh, for the last presentation, last paper. Uh, please scream very loudly if I am not keeping the time, even if we we'll try to keep an eye on the clock. Uh, all right. So, uh, don't look at the titles, very long title. We are looking for a better one, I think, with, with Antonella and Juan. Um, the question we have, uh, well, besides all the questions that we already mentioned that are about the uh, more generally 
the, the issue of European macroeconomics, etc. But the question specifically that we have in our paper is about how macroeconomists address interdependence across, across national economies. And we are deciding to focus more specifically on one way to address this question, that is large-scale multi-country macroeconometric models, which started emerging in the 70s and remained very popular till today. But we will say for some reasons that we, I will explain later, we are cutting off our story at the, in the 90s. So looking at this specific object, so large-scale multi-country macroeconometric models, to us is a way to broaden the scope of three literatures that already exist. So one is, let's say, the history of macroeconomics, but more specifically a subset, which is the history of international macroeconomics. Uh, and this, I will say, it's uh, uh, a field about which we have still a lot to learn. Uh, of course, because the issue we are trying to address is the issue of interdependence across national economies. Well, uh, that's one of the most pressing issues for uh, European macroeconomists, right? Because it also has to do with the uh, specific, specific issues of the uh, process of economic, monetary, and political integration of Europe, uh, starting from the 50s, right? Uh, and the third literature we try to contribute to is the history of uh, European institutions and the place of economics within these uh, European institutions, uh, which is, again, a very specific uh, setting, a very specific context, because by definition, those institutions were entrusted with uh, supporting and assessing uh, policy coordination and uh, uh, the, the building of this integration across national economies. Of course, what we are naturally led to ask is if uh, is whether uh, looking at macroeconomic interdependencies through multi-country uh, multi-country models. Uh, has any distinctive theoretical or empirical or even like technical like computational challenges uh, and so this is really what we uh, the, 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 our questions is boiled down to in the end is there anything that is different when you are building a multi-country model that is different from when you're uh, building a single country macroeconometric model uh, and of course, the bit of theory that is particularly uh, under scrutiny here will be that specific bit of theory that makes the linkage between the national economics that are in your multi-country models. And so how uh, model economies, national model economies are linked, uh, are connected, and are interdependent through trade flows, monetary flows, financial and capital flows, etc. So that's what we are trying to look at. And we are trying to look at this uh, in a very, very specific uh, institutional setting, which is uh, Division C of the Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs of the Commission for the European Economic Community at the time. So in short, we are looking at what's going on at the DG2. Uh, that's the short name for it. And uh, more specifically, what's going on with this Division uh, C of the DG2, which is the one uh, in charge of uh, macroeconomic analysis, uh, and more specifically of short-term forecasting. This uh, division uh, within the DG2 uh, developed several multi-country models. Three were developed in-house, so they were, let's say, mostly managed by uh, DG2 staff economists. The first one is the one that it's 
uh, at the center of our story, it's called the Eurolink model. And then you have two others, Compat and Quest. Note that Quest is, uh, well, there, there, there have been three generations of this last model. Uh, and the, the last one is the one still in use at the DG2. But beside these in-house built models, DG2 also uh, asked uh, in decades to outside economists to build models for them. Uh, and uh, these are most of the models that were, uh, sorry, these were, uh, are the main models that were developed for the DG2, but by outside economists. So we are trying to look at this specific case, at all these multi-country models, and trying to see what are the theoretical or empirical debates and challenging with building this type of models. And that's our answer in very short. We find that there were two competing modeling strategies. The first one is what we will call, uh, so that's our word, uh, the decentralized modeling strategy. And that's, that is the strategy that was used for, model, uh, for the model called Eurolink. Decentralized strategy is about having national teams building single country models with their own view about how a large scale macroeconometric model should be built. Their own view in terms of theory, of specification, of size, of data use, et cetera, et cetera. Then to have all these national models passed to the DG2 uh, team, which will take care of linking these national models for Eurolink, this was only a linkage through trade, so bilateral trade equations. And this gave rise to Eurolink, a multi-country model, right? So you have national models, single country built by national teams, that's the decentralized part, and then you take them uh, to the DG2 and you link them, and that makes your multi-country model. So of course you can imagine very easily what is the alternative strategy to this uh, for building a multi-country model. And this is what we call the centralized uh, modeling strategy, which was adopted by uh, the DG2 for all the other models basically that they developed or asked to be developed. Very simply, multi-country model that it's built by a unique team. So either a DG2 in-house team or consultants, right? So they build a multi-country model. In this centralized building, all the countries will have more or less same theoretical uh, specification, size, etc. So all the countries in the model are modeled in a homogeneous way. Then the countries are linked by trade or financial or monetary mechanism, and that's it. So our question is why historically we see a competition between these two strategies and why one strategy was favored over another at different moments in time, right? So <clears throat> we have a lot of materials uh, because we have found uh, uh, extraordinarily rich archives. Uh, so we have a lot of details and things to say but I will just jump very quickly to some highlights of some very important ideas. So the DG2 was definitely uh, going through a very specific transformation at the uh, end of the 70s. Um, so these are the tasks uh, that were uh, attributed to the DG2 and especially uh, what was going on in the 70s is that new task came up, which was to like really produce uh, an annual economic report with forecasting of ma macroeconomic variables, etc. And what happened at the end of the 70s as well is that this uh, smiling and cheerful uh, Italian economist take, uh, took sorry, uh, responsibility as the general director of DG2. So this is Tommaso Padua Schioppa who wanted to make the DG2 a more professionalized uh, service of 
uh, economic expertise for the commission. When he arrived at the DG2, that's the way he describes the situation. Uh, the commission economic work, so produced by DG2, uh, was uh, too much publications, approximate, analytically poor, and original. And what he wanted to do was to professionalize this economic expertise to establish, of course, the, the credibility and the persuasiveness of the uh, European Commission vis-a-vis -vis of the state members and other international organizations. So what Tommaso Padoschiappa did was to change the working of this DG2, the working of the institution, in many different ways that are very well recounted by Ivo Maes in his own papers. And what we are trying to look at very specifically is that macroeconometric models were a key part of this professionalization strategy. And was, it was Tommaso Padua Schiappa who decided that the DG2 should stop to rely exclusively on models produced on the outside. This was, by the way, uh, models produced on the outside were mostly produced by Belgian-based economists, and especially by Valbroek, who we already mentioned, and Dramé uh, at the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and uh, Dalcantara and Barton, who were at CORE, or Université Catholique de Louvain, uh, before the separation, if I'm correct. So Tommaso Padraschiap said, that's very nice to have these consultants and to have these models around, but we need our own model. We need to develop our own uh, uh, model. And that was the Eurolink project, who was entrusted to another Italian economy called Paolo Ranuzzi, uh, who was then uh, running the project basically alone. But of course, his own responsibility was just to link models that were developed by national teams. So what Ranuzzi did, what the Eurolink project was in the beginning, was simply to have to design this uh, linkage system to connect models that already existed and were maintained nationally. The purpose was to produce economic forecasts, very short-term forecasts. And to have the possibility to run some simulation for scenarios, but this ended up very quickly to uh, be very, very complicated. So what Ranuzzi did was these trade equations, which were, he, he already had been thinking about for a while in his own personal path. And uh, these are the models that were uh, linked by these trade equations. So you had a, a model for the French economy developed by the INSEE. Uh, you have a model for the, you had a model for West Germany, one model for Italy, one model for the UK, and later a model from Belgium and one for the US. All these national models were part of Project Link. Project Link, everyone knows this, I think, here was this project devised by Lawrence Klein at the end of the 60s, who was a project to build a very large scale multi country model for the world economy, following what? Following precisely the, uh, the, 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 central, the decentralized strategy that we were describing for Eurolink. So you have national teams building national models, and then you link all of this uh, through trade equations. So you see that the, uh, the strategy at the European uh, uh, Commission to build uh, a, a multi-country model was in the beginning really inspired by this project link uh, strategy that is to rely on uh, national models to uh, then put them together through some linkage equations. But it's even more than this because the linkage system in a Eurolink, so this is the uh, trade allocation uh, model that makes the connection between the different economies through trade, this trade equation is precisely the same that was, I mean, in spirit, like theoretically founded, is the same as the one that was developed for Project Link. So this first uh, multi-country model built by the European Commission, by the DG2, was very much inspired by uh, a US-based project, which was Project Link. 
I will have to accelerate on the skepticism and criticism that uh, Eurolink had to face within the DG2 very uh, shortly after the start of the project, two or three years uh, after that. And these debates brought to the dismissal of this Eurolink project in 83. We have a lot of details on this because we have a lot of archives. I think it's the first time I've been working on, 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 on models in, in, in policymaking institutions for a while, but I think this is for the very first time where I see uh, 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 so much material ex when you have really the, uh, the opinions and the debates uh, on paper very clearly, uh, so debates about the transparency of the model, the usage of the model, uh, the stuff that it's needed, that it's, uh, that it's lacking, the costs with figures, uh, uh, the computer problem. So we have a lot about this, but I cannot say much uh, just to conclude very briefly, because I'm already over time. Uh, after the dismissal of Eurolink, another uh, economist is brought in to the DG2. His name was André Dramé. Uh, who came from Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, he was a student of Jean Valbrug. We already mentioned him. Uh, and Dramé was interested with building a new model that will be called Compact, and then that will evolve in the model called Quest. And what Dramé did was to change the approach and to build a multi-country model that was uh, centralized. So all was done within the DG2. Uh, and this um, uh, would lead to, uh, well, to the, to the, actually to the current, uh, so Quest is the, 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 the evolution of this compact project by Drame. And so this is the current way uh, that the European Commission has to, uh, to, to build and to use multi-country models. Uh, yeah. I think that's it. I already abused my uh, time and uh, we have exactly as planned 30 minutes for discussion. And I should stop scaring, sharing my screen, right? Okay. So Mauro is up first, I think, for questions. Yes, thank you, Francesco. I enjoy very much this session, and I, I, I may be the only non-European attending this session, by the way, apart perhaps from Ariano, who is, of course, from Israel. Uh, and uh, and this, this is really terrific. It's a very interesting session. I have a, a couple of remarks about uh, on the paper by, by Mathieu uh, and, uh, and um, Roma. And uh, it's, it's, it has to do with this geographical sense of Europe. I mean, of course, this is a geographical concept. And uh, first of all, what about the UK? Uh, uh, is it part of Europe? Maybe it's not, but <laughs> it's certainly not part of continental Europe, but it is European after all. And, uh, and uh, I don't think it was mentioned in your presentation. And, uh, um, it, for instance, to be more specific, people like uh, Richard Portis, they, 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 they were important, especially in connection with uh, uh, an aspect that you highlighted uh, uh, very correctly, that is planning and econometric methods for planning this equilibrium. He played an important role there. And, and uh, from that uh, perspective, it's interesting that uh, uh, part of his work, or maybe the, the, the more interesting part of his work, was done in co-authorship with an American economist, Richard Quant from, from Princeton. So, uh, uh, of, okay, there were, some, uh, there were some important distinctions between the US and Europe, but at the same time, I don't think we should exclude uh, as, an, as an assumption that there were no interactions on that between North American and European economists, especially if we consider uh, uh, British economists as part of, of Europe. I think that would enrich your, 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 your uh, historic account a little bit. So that's my, my humble suggestion. How does it work, Francesco? You want to? 
Uh, as you like, we can collect more questions or, or you can- I can reply the... rapidly uh, because uh, it's, it's simple. So uh, thanks a lot, Moro, for your suggestion. Uh, we do plan to speak about what was going on in the UK because as you correctly stressed, there were important like contributors to the literature there. You mentioned uh, uh, Richard Portes, but there is also um, David Winters, for instance. Um, uh, so we do plan to talk about this and regarding the connection between Kant and Portes, it's true that a general equilibrium model with rationing and in, and in particular the empirical implication or test of this model were a topic discussed uh, in the US, but mainly around Kant in, at Princeton University. And when you take a look carefully about what Kant was doing, uh, especially with his work with Harvey Rosen, is that it's not really a general equilibrium model that he was testing. He, he focused on, uh, uh, on, on the labor market in a partial equilibrium framework. So you could find techniques used in disequilibrium econometrics uh, in this work, but this remains different from what, were, uh, what was do done, for instance, in France by Gourierou, Montfort, Lafont, or, uh, we, uh, or Patrick Artus, um, but also in Belgium uh, with uh, Henri Sissens that did use a technique for general equilibrium model. So you had interaction between markets, you had spillovers, and this created an amount of difficulties and a amount of uh, um, uh, discussion in method that you don't find in the US, but you do find in Europe. Thanks. I've seen Beatrice and then Antonella and then Aurelien. Aurelien, yes. we, are, uh, we already heard you. <laughs> I think Antonella was first. As, as you like. Can I? Okay, just a very quick question again to, to Romain and Mathieu. Um, you mentioned some people you would like to interview about this equilibrium uh, program, research and so on. Why do not consider also people like uh, um, Drame, uh, Francesco mentioned, because Drame at the European Union was trying to carry out to to do a macroeconometric model, a disequilibrium macroeconometric model. This was what he was trying to do in the, light, in the late 18th. So maybe it could be interesting to understand from him what kind of difficulties at the end he found and they renounced to, to, to go ahead with this kind of, uh, of project. And the second question is just a curiosity. How do you construct a database? Uh, uh, by considering also books. <laughs> you mentioned that you are constructing a database looking at articles and books, but book online books, so because we are doing something similar in Italy, where until the 70s, most leading economists only publish books and not articles, but it is very complicated. Do you have any idea? <laughs> but maybe you can speak also in a late, um... Okay, so this is my question. Thank you. Beatrice can ask her questions, so we collect uh, all the questions and then. We... Okay, so this, these are two questions for Aurelien and, and, and Alexandre. Uh, um, the first one is basically the same that Mauro asked, but for Sunspot, because there is also this. And you, this show up as saying, okay, there is a continuity in the sunspot tradition, and 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 well, my own approach to sunspot is that it's super hard to disentangle the the European from the American perspective because there is pretty systematic uh, co-authorship there. So how do you handle that? I mean, again, that's a. Uh, I don't want to push my agenda. That's what that's what we wrote with Aurelien. Maybe there's different stuff, but I mean, to us, the core is largely Azariadis Genry and 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 Grand Mon, uh, Grand Moncas and and and, and 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 whatsoever. And uh, so that would be the first question. The second question uh, is whether you can say it's uh, for rather for coordination purpose with our current research and 
uh, I wanted to know what's behind that sort of alternative uh, uh, European program for micro foundations, uh, which research you put under that. Uh, Aurelien, you had a question and the answer then. Okay, great. I have a question for Romain. Romain. Yeah. Uh, so um, I was wondering how much were developed the connection discussions uh, between the economists using rational models and the other one uh, who's working on Western European countries, uh, for instance. Okay, and so I'm do you see sorry. a kind of can you repeat it, Kat, uh, or rien? Yeah, sorry. Uh, was there some discussions, connection, integration between the economists using rationing models of Eastern countries, uh, Eastern European countries, and those uh, working on Western European countries? And so do you see kind of separation between the two groups or where the links tied? And I have a second point, which is a bit linked to that. Uh, so it seems you are going uh, to a certain extent in the direction of explaining the fall of disequilibrium by the general economic context. So you were talking about the transition in Eastern countries uh, and in Western countries in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, it's a period of deregulation of prices, uh, which means rationing models could have appeared less relevant. So I was wondering if a good test would be to, to look at the fall of the disequilibrium program in Western countries and in Eastern countries and to see if there is some difference or, or not. And so now I have to answer to the questions, that's it. You, can, you could. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, so how to, to, how to handle the difference between uh, US and Europe and the uh, sunspots? Um, what what, what I, I have chosen to, to, to focus and to highlight like this community in the presentation uh, between it was linked to the disequilibrium one. But the, 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 the funny thing is that it, it seems in, in our data, it's really a European based uh, community. So it's dominated by uh, economists in Europe, but it's not, uh, it's equivalently published in the European Economic Review and in the top five. So, so this was uh, something interesting. Uh, and so you have many collaborations indeed, but what we are able to check with our data is uh, to see when this is only European uh, publishing, who they are cited and which words they are using. So this, this, this work we have already do it with, uh, with Aurelien, but uh, so we, we can do that and we can check which references are cited most by uh, US-based uh, economists. So, so we can, we can check if the, the, the differences are uh, signif significant or not and to check if we can learn something. The, the interesting things with uh, this large database is that we can also go further than uh, looking at the most uh, well-known economists working on, on, on Sunspot. So that would be something to, to check. And I was, wasn't sure for your second question you were speaking about to, I, I, I've, spoke, I've spoken about the alternative tradition in micro foundations. Uh, so I, I was thinking to the disequilibrium theory, which was really at the time, uh, something which uh, in a way as, as, as uh, the goal was to, to be an alternative to the new classical programs. And we, what, what is interesting is that it's, uh, you, you don't have the opponents in the European Economic Review. So you don't have many works about uh, Lucas or Sargent and the community of the new classical micro is clearly in the side of the top five and not in the European Economic Review. So, so I was wondering if it could be explained by, by the fact that uh, you, have, you have a preference in Europe for, for this alternative research, uh, alternative micro foundations research program. Sorry, this is peak time for kids right now. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, might, I, I, I was just wondering whether you, you would find other uh, types of uh, micro foundational programs. This is a totally parochial, parochial question uh, that ties to my own paper. And I was thinking more specifically or either Garman, Milbauer, uh, um, aggregation program like Hildebrand, uh, Grandmont, Gorman, people like that. I think many of that seems to be a bit linked with the disequilibrium theory, but yes, of course, I, I have to check for that. Okay. 
All right, so Roma, I think you have some pending questions, right? I do, but maybe we should ask whether people have questions for your paper. I have already talked, so if you could have the possibility for, for, to have I don't feedbacks. see any questions, so go, go ahead, go ahead. Ah, oh, we, we, okay. still have, we still have 20 minutes. Ah, okay, uh, cool. I'm... Cool, cool, cool. Right. right. So, Thanks so, a lot. Go ahead. Thanks a lot for all this uh, uh, question and suggestion. Uh, to be frank, we had not thought about uh, interviewing uh, Drame, uh, Antonella. I mean, I had not thought about it, but it could be a good idea. Although we, al we already have like a really, really huge material when you take into account the, 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 the articles, books, and, and, uh, and uh, the interview that we, we already have uh, conducted. But thanks for the suggestion. Speaking about the about the books and the and the article, uh, how <laughs> I, I use the word uh, data be the a large data set. I think that uh, I have to admit that it's not what uh, what Alexandre or, or or Elian are doing right now. We are just doing something that is really artisanal with Mathieu. We read as much as we can. And we, we bring together uh, all the references and, and that's it. So just to, to, to complement a bit this uh, answer, we are not, we were thinking about using bibliometrics method at the beginning and we had the chance to, and thanks uh, Orien for taking the time uh, to talk about that with us. Uh, but in the end with Mathieu, we decided that that we don't really need to uh, conduct bibliometric uh, uh, um, analysis given how we uh, raise questions. And we already have like really strong arguments to explain both the deployment and the disappearance of general equilibrium and with rationing. Um, regarding your question, um, Mathieu, if you want to, to say something, go ahead in the chat huh, and compliment. The, uh, Aurélien, regarding your question, regarding the intensity of the discussion between the East and the West, I, 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 I would say that there were not much discussion, but there were some. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, this is something that Shahamza told me while he was uh, explaining to me how he used general equilibrium model with rationing uh, in the 80s. What he did was something really simple. He knew that Jean-Jacques Lafon had designed this method uh, for applying general equilibrium models with rationing to test this type of model. He sent a working paper to Jean-Jacques Lafon asking him whether and how he could use his method to adapt it to uh, plan, pl planned economy. And there were some discussion between the two uh, economists uh, and econ uh, this way. Uh, this is the type of uh, proof that we have. And as you can see, uh, so far at least, I, don't, I cannot say way more on the discussion between uh, Europe, uh, Western economists and Eastern economists. Um, so regarding the end of uh, or the disappearance of general equilibrium models, uh, are we focusing only on the economic context? No. Uh, so this is the wrong impression that I might have given to you because I chose to pick one specific factor in the disappearance of general equilibrium models with rationing, but there, there are a lot more different uh, other uh, factors. So one factor that is particularly important for uh, general equilibrium theorists at the time, and one of the reasons why they stopped losing interest in this type of model is that they were kind of thinking that with this type of model, they could go beyond the Breux. So they could have like a model that would meet the mathematical rigor and the generality of the, of the Breux theory of value and that at the same time could explain how uh, ec market economies work. And what happened is that as soon as they moved to the analysis of the dynamics of non-clearing market, and this is really clear, for instance, in uh, Antoine Dautum's PhD thesis, they were really disappointed because they could not say anything general about the dynamics of non-clearing market. And the reason is simple is that once you, have the once you move to the dynamics, you have a demultiplication of regime and in each regime, you have different behavior. So the type of dynamic analysis that you can perform is super limited by the amount of information that are differ different depending on the regime in which the economy is. And this is important because they could not make progress in a general way in the analysis of the dynamics of non-clearing market. 
And the S told me this was a source of frustration. And this is why even if uh, uh, Jacques Dress kept telling me, ah, oh, we need to keep working on this model, they are really interesting. I lost interest in these models in the end. So he framed it this way in, in the interview. Now, regarding the, the, the difference of factors between the West and the East in the disappearance of model, this is a really interesting question. And we have like a, an interesting story to tell here with Mathieu. The interesting story is that in the East, they did not care about the dynamics. So, because for them, price were fixed forever. Sharemza told me, the, 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 the situation this way. So all the problems surrounded the analysis of the dynamics of non-carrying markets, including the incorporation of expectations, were not really a big issue for them. And so the reason why they decided to stop developing the, these models are different from people in, on, on, in Western Europe. And as I mentioned, uh, they decided to stop main, mainly because uh, of the transition towards market economies. Go ahead, Beatrice, ask your question. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I. Uh, do we want to follow up on that? Because I don't think the Stockholm Bocconi question was answered. So yeah, my my yeah. my follow up question is: uh, so trying to uh, connect the papers and other stuff that are being written uh, together. One one question was that whether there was general sense of uneasiness with, with any type of model that would generate indeterminacy and in multiple equilibria, because. Uh, for us, this was one, one element in the rejection of, of, of sunspot theory. We also find by working on, in our work on, on, on heterogeneous agents uh, models that um, many economists who turn to heterogeneous agent uh, uh, models were trying to do this in a way that would not generate multiple equilibria. And, and if you want to cross further, you can even argue that some part of the history of game theory at that, at that time was very much about uh, the nationification of, uh, of game theory was very much about trying to settle on models that would that would sort of like generate one, one equilibria. And when you had a multiplicity, people could not do much with that. So that, that was the sense of my question. Okay, um, thanks a lot Beatrice for, for this question. Uh, and this is a really interesting question for us uh, because uh, we do have an answer to, to that, especially because we focused on the empirical side of the story. Uh, because the problem of multiple equilibria and the problem of uh, the treatment of heterogeneity was really important for all the scholars that try to use general equilibrium model with versioning to test the models against the data. So regarding the issue of multiple equilibria, it was a, a, a big problem for a while over the 70s, because within different regimes, even if you make strong assumption, you cannot guarantee that there is, not non, there is no uh, non-linearity within the regime. And because of that, they could not prove what they call the coherency uh, condition. Uh, so the existence of a solution and this was a big problem because showing the existence of a unique equilibrium within a, a specific uh, regime was central to apply the model. So there, there, there has been discussion about the condition under which a non valrasian equilibrium is unique or not. And this is an important aspect of the story because you, you can see here discussion between people that were at the CEPRE map and the people that were at NSAE, for instance, they were talking. So in the, in the I mentioned the work of Gouyeiro Lafont Montfort in 1980, which is the first method for estimating a general equilibrium model with versioning. And they have these footnotes uh, that refer to a, a work by Jean-Michel Grandmont. And Grandmont had managed to find the condition under which uh, non valrasian equilibrium is unique. And my impression is that based on discussion between all these economists, they could move on and provide this method for, for, for uh, estimating the, the, the model. 
Uh, that's for the multiplicity of equilibria and how it was addressed. And regarding the, the importance of heterogeneity, I'm not sure whether I, I, I correctly understood your question, Beatrice, but I'm going to say what I, uh, what I have in mind. Um, so when you take a look at the theoretical contribution on general equilibrium model with rationing, the first model that you have in mind, I guess, is Malambo 77 or Barrow Grossman 60, uh, 1971. Sorry for the French. Um, and, uh, and these models are aggregate model, right? You have uh, one consumer, one firm, etc. But when you move to the analysis of what was done on the empirical side, you had a bunch of discussion on how to introduce heterogeneity into the models, into this equilibrium model. So you have discussion by uh, Mühlbauer and Portes in the UK. So Moreau, yes, we talk about what's going on in the, in the UK. And by the way, we interviewed uh, John Mühlbauer to get a sense of what he was doing and the reason why he was developing general equilibrium model at the time. But you also have a, reflect, a discussion on how to introduce heterogeneity in France by uh, Trognon, Lafont, Montfort. At this stage, I don't know yet how heterogeneity is addressed uh, from a, an econometric perspective. It's pretty technical. But if, if you are interested, I can give you the references and we can talk about this for sure. Aurélien, you're still short of an answer, I think, on Stockholm um, Bocconi or something like this. And then we will have time for one last question, if there is any. OK. Uh, I, I, have, I have no good answer to, to bring to that. But uh, the connection is going through uh, Tabellini and Persson. Uh, Tabellini and Persson. Persson was in Stockholm, and, and, and Tabellini was uh, first in the US and then in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and so they, 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 they just work a lot together uh, on uh, political macroeconomy. On, uh, they, they, I think they have a handbook together uh, about the central bank, political macroeconomy, monetary policy frameworks, and uh, central bank independence, etc. So, so that was the the, the 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 many economists from Stockholm and from uh, and from Bocconi and in Italy in general were uh, were working on this topic and. Uh, Tabellini and, and person will, were the, the two making the, the connections, but uh, so I should investigate more of this kind of uh, this kind of connection. And so I, I, I had a question for you, Francesco, if you if I can go with it. Uh, go so yeah, I, perhaps perhaps I've missed something in your presentation, but you are not referring to the general academic context. I would say. Uh, so I, I, I'm not saying that's a, that's a problem, but I was just wondering if you you find some evidence about the, the modelers in the DG2 reacting to rising criticisms against uh, structural macroeconomic models uh, and to what extent it could have been uh, important in the change of models. I'm not sure I'm getting what you have in mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I was just thinking to, to, the, to the, the late 70s or to the 80s where um, in the academic field, uh, the, the, the structural macroeconometric models were losing popularity and you had more and more criticism about this kind of model. And I was just wondering if it could have impacted. Uh, oh, yeah. But, uh, well, I, I, yes, I, I see. Well, so, sorry, I, my mistake. I, mean, uh, I thought we were past this in the sense that indeed we, the, the DG2 is the same as most policymaking institutions that have been studied so far. Uh, so uh, as we have seen uh, when we have been working on the Bank of England or the Fed or Bank of Italy, I guess, or whatever, uh, these academic criticism are not uh, reaching their targets at all. So large scale macroeconomic modeling is still going on and on and on. Uh, of course, not totally uh, un undisturbed, by, but the, the critic is heard, but it's not uh, retained as a valid one. And this is obviously the, the, the case as well for uh, multi-country models. So it's, it's in, in this sense, this is not a, a difference 
uh, that we see between uh, building a multi-country model and building a, a, a single country national model. Uh, I don't know that that was what you, the, 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 did, did I understood correctly your, your question? Yes, yes, that's it. But in the Bank of England, for instance, I think they, they, I think they, they, they had to react more or less to the debate about personal expectations and uh, just uh, try to implement it in different way. Or I, just, I was just wondering if, it, as, as the pressure from, from the academic world existed, I was just wondering if there were reactions. So. Well, uh, la later on, so uh, late 80s, Antonella has late something 80s, to say yeah. about exactly. this. Exactly, yeah. much late, much much later, no? we've seen that the last uh, version of Quest uh, completely change uh, and they abandon, they, they go toward the DGS model, but before, no. There is maybe some reference, Francesco, if you, if you remember, in the Weimar report in the late 70s, they asked for more manageable model, maybe no more so large, huge scale model, but you seem something much more, uh, not, not strictly connected with the academic debate, but they simply did something that was maybe easier to, to manage. Yeah, and I, I may add really that uh, in 78, when Tommaso Paduaschioppa uh, takes the, the, the lead of this uh, DG2, uh, this is directorate of the, 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 the European Commission, its purpose is to professionalize the institution. And so to make the institution abide by the best standards he has in mind, professional standards. Well, so, and I, I must say, because I, we have been reading through all the, the, uh, the papers and the notes of Tommaso Paduaschioppa, so we know that he's some, someone very rigorous that makes lists of things that are important, and it explains why. Definitely in these things that were important to professionalize the institutions, Russian expectations were not an item or, uh, you know, kind of neoclassical uh, academic fashions or these kind of things the, from, from the US, they were not a standards that they were trying to develop. And if they were, if, if, if they have the, at the it, 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 it will be there. If, if it would be in this list, in these documents, if this was the case. So without guessing, we can say that it was not at all important at the turn of the 80s. Then at the end of the 80s, that's another story indeed. Any other questions, issues, comments? Or otherwise, we can say goodbye and see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you everyone for this session. Thank Hi you. Roger. <laughs>